Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about facet joints in the cervical spine. Facet joints are, are synovial joints that are also called zygopophyseal joints. Generally speaking, it's an articulation between the inferior articular facet of the vertebra above and the superior articular facet of the vertebra below. So when we're discussing this, it's important to remember that when we say the superior facet, uh, the superior facet faces upward, and so it has to be on the vertebra below. Okay? Um, when we talk about the inferior facet, that has to face down because it's inferior, so it's on the vertebra above. And this white tissue right here, this is the facet joint capsule, um, and again, inside the joint, we're going to have features of a synovial joint, some of which we'll discuss down here and on other slides. Now, where the cervical spine uh, differs from the other regions, potentially, is the orientation of these articular facets. Okay? So when we look at the superior articular facet, okay, remember, when we say superior articular facet, we're actually talking about the one on the vertebra below because it faces superiorly. Okay, if you look at this, okay, notice that the actual joint line is at an angle. So as you go posteriorly, the angle actually goes down. It's actually at a decline going uh, posteriorly. So that superior facet right here on the bottom, it faces superiorly, of course, but it actually faces a little bit posteriorly. If you were to draw a line showing where it faces, that's actually going in the posterior direction, right? Whereas the inferior articular facet, remember that's on top because, of course, it has to face inferiorly, it's actually oriented a little bit anteriorly. So if you draw a line uh, coming from that facet where it's going, it's facing a little bit anteriorly. And so overall, this facet joint line is about roughly 45 degrees to the horizontal. I guess you could say 45 degrees to the vertical also. But if you draw a horizontal line like this, it's approximately 45 degrees below that. Okay, um, And that's important to remember. Now, uh, the facet joints are lined by hyaline cartilage on both facets. So both the superior and inferior articular processes have hyaline cartilage. If we look at this uh, image right here, here's your inferior articular process of the vertebra above, right? And here's your superior articular process of the vertebra below. In this picture on the left, this lighter region right here, this is actually hyaline cartilage. They stained it in this image. And the hyaline cartilage actually comes out a sort of purple in color, so you can see that a little bit better. That's the hyaline cartilage. That's one important characteristic of a synovial joint, is that hyaline cartilage, or articular cartilage. The dark region between the hyaline cartilage, uh, that's really just the joint space. Okay? Um, there's synovial fluid in that space. And then this circle right here, this represents the beginning of a fat pad. So it's important to understand that facet joints actually have a fat pad, um, which acts to cushion the joint a little bit, and it behaves sort of like a meniscus in the knee. Now, the meniscus, of course, is fibrocartilage. This is fat. This is adipose tissue, but it be can behave in a similar manner. And what you can actually see right here in this slightly darker region uh, that's coming off of the circle, a little bit of that fat pad is actually encroaching um, into the joint space, and that's actually a normal thing. Uh, it's not pathologic. Sometimes that fat pad can encroach into the joint space to provide a little bit of extra cushioning. Now, being that these fat pads are um, adipose tissue, uh, they're supplied with blood vessels. So they can bleed if there's trauma. So for example, if you have a whiplash, an acute type of injury to the neck, um, the fat pads can bleed. Also, the fat pads are innervated. Okay, they have a nerve supply, and so they can potentially be a pain generator in the cervical spine. So we just talked about this part up here. Those fat pads, they can bleed because they have a blood supply, and they also have innervation, so they can act as a pain generator. Additionally, the facet joint itself has innervation. Okay? Uh, the facet joints are actually innervated by the medial branch of the dorsal ramus of the spinal nerve at the same level. So that's a mouthful, but basically what it means is this. Imagine, for example, that this vertebra right here, this is C4. I don't know which one it is. Let's say it's C4. This one below it's C5. So this hole right here, 
that's anterior to the facet joint, keep in mind that that's anterior to it, is the intervertebral foramen. And that's where spinal nerves exit on either side from the spinal cord. So um, if this is C4 above and this is C5 below, this would actually be the C5 spinal nerve, and it exits through there. Well, the spinal nerve divides into a ventral and a dorsal ramus. So it's actually a branch from that dorsal ramus of the spinal nerve that actually innervates that facet joint. So this would be the facet joint between C4 and C5, or the C4-5 facet joint. So it would actually be the C5 spinal nerve that would actually be um, innervating that facet joint. And because the, the facet joint is innervated, the facet joint itself, in addition to the fat pad, uh, can also be a potential pain generator in the cervical spine. Okay. Um, another thing that's also important to remember is if you have irritation of the facet joint by any means, um, you can actually get the release of inflammatory mediators, so chemicals that can also irritate the nerve root um, coming out of this intervertebral foramen. But the point is, is that the zygopophyseal joint, the facet joint, and its fat pad are pain generators. Now, what happens if somebody has facet joint dysfunction? Well, here's some common symptoms and signs that we're going to look at. So symptoms being things that the patient complains of. So the pain is going to be sharp, localized, unilateral pain. Now, what that means is that if, let's say, they have uh, dysfunction of this facet joint right here. This is the left facet joint. We know that because this is the spinous process. This is posterior. These bodies are anterior, so this is the left side. So if this is left facet joint dysfunction, they're going to feel pain on the left side. Okay. It's going to be sharp pain. It's going to be pretty well localized to that region. Okay. Um, there may be spasms of the muscles in that area. And unlike the uncovertebral joint dysfunction that we talked about um, in another video, uh, it's very common for facet joint dysfunction to cause referral into the upper extremity. And so if there's a left facet joint dysfunction, then we may, may have referral into the left upper extremity, really the proximal part, because um, it can go from the lower neck really into the, the shoulder and scapular region. Now what's important is that neck pain, so the pain caused by the facet joint dysfunction directly, is more or greater than the pain in the upper extremity that's referred. Okay. Um, now the upper extremity pain, it's important to know those referral patterns because each level, each facet joint, this is C4-5, we could have C5, C6. The different facet joints refer to a different area. So if you know those areas and they say they have pain in that area, that can help you backtrack to figure out which facet joint potentially has the dysfunction. Okay. Now the signs, these are actually pretty straightforward when you think about them. You shouldn't memorize these, you should understand why these are signs of facet joint dysfunction. Let's think about the movements of the spine. Okay? We've got flexion, we've got extension, we've got lateral flexion, and we've got rotation. Right? Those are four major movements. Now as you remember from previous videos, it doesn't matter which region of the spine we're looking at, it's all the same. Remember that when you go into flexion, uh, remember that the facet joint actually opens up. Okay? Those two articulating surfaces, the inferior articular facet and the superior articular facet, they can come closer together. They can also become further apart. Right? Flexion movements, so when you bend your neck forward, that would take the facet joints and move them further apart. They would separate. Okay? Extension does the opposite, so when you bend your head backward, that actually causes the uh, articular surfaces to approximate. So the joint actually closes. And so when we think about signs of facet joint dysfunction, we're going to consider things that close the facet joint. Okay? Why would we do that? Well, if the facet joint's irritated, we don't want to bring those bones closer together. It might actually feel better uh, to bring them further apart. So any movement that brings these uh, bones closer together, approximates them, is going to be limited. So the first thing that's limited is extension. That's the most obvious one. If you move your head backwards, if you bend it backwards, uh, these facet joints are going to come closer together. They're going to go into more of their closed, packed position. That's going to irritate the facet joint, so that movement will be limited. Also, ipsilateral rotation. What does that mean? So we said this is a left facet joint dysfunction. So if you rotate your head to the left and the facet joint dysfunctions on the left, 
that's going to close the left facet joint. Now the right facet joint would open up. Okay, So when you rotate your head, whatever side you're rotating toward, that facet joint closes, Okay, particularly in the lower cervical spine. So if I have left facet joint dysfunction, rotating to the left is going to be painful because rotating to the left closes the left facet joint. So that's what ipsilateral rotation means. If I have a left dysfunction, I'm not going to want to rotate to that direction. In contrast, if it was a right facet joint dysfunction, I'm not going to want to rotate my head to the right. Okay. Also, ipsilateral lateral flexion or side bending. So the same thing's true there of rotation. If I have left facet joint dysfunction, I'm not going to want to laterally bend my neck to the left because that's going to also close this facet joint. And so the bottom line with this is these people who have facet joint dysfunction are going to have limited movement and or pain in any one of these movements of the neck that brings that facet joint into more of a closed pack position. Anything that closes or approximates that facet joint. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. Now back to the symptoms. We talked about that the facet joints refer into the upper extremity. So how do we know what level of the neck the facet joint dysfunction is at? Now for the referral patterns of the facet joints. So this picture right here is from a study where they basically took a saline solution and they injected it directly into the facet joint. Now of course that's going to cause facet joint pain, but it could also cause refer pain. And they tracked where the patients actually felt that referred pain. And so this is more or less what they found. So the C23 facet joint, that refers to the posterior inferior auricular, so uh, really behind and, and inferior to the ear, and a little bit of the upper neck right here. Okay? C3, C4 uh, is the inferior auricular region, so behind the ear, so below it, um, and the upper and lower neck. C4, 5, a little bit of overlap there, uh, really the upper lower neck, and the proximal shoulder, it goes into the shoulder region. C5-6, really the lower neck, um, proximal and distal shoulder, and also a little bit of the upper thoracic right here. And then C6-C7, C6, C7, we have the lower neck. This should this distal should not be there. It's really just proximal shoulder right here. It actually doesn't go into the distal part of it like C5-C6 C6 does. But then we get upper and even into the middle thoracic region over here. And so if someone was to suspect that they have set joint dysfunction, they could look at the potential referral patterns and get a good idea of actually which facet joint has the dysfunction. Okay? So if you had referred pain down into the lower part of the scapula right here, okay, there's no other facet joint that refers to the lower half of the scapula. So that might actually rule up that it's the C6, C7 facet joint, if that makes sense. So... Hopefully, this video gave you a good understanding of the anatomy and some applications of the facet joints. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.